Hey, thanks for watching Make Me Smart on YouTube. If you would like to keep on watching, hit that subscribe button and you will never miss an episode. Oh, hey everyone, it's Molly Wood. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's Kai. This is Make Me Smart, where Molly and I get together to talk about tech and the economy and culture and you, because this is what it's all about. You uh, get to weigh in, because <laughs> as we like to say, none of us is as smart as all of us. I'm going to say that again. You. I know. I really like how you're taking care of the audience today. I know. That's We're me. We're here I'm, for you. I'm the caring soul in this podcast. Had you not noticed? How are you guys <laughs> feeling? Do you need uh, a hug? Yeah, uh, today... <laughs> Today we're it's not a feel good show. So, I'm just going to I'm going to throw that out there now. And maybe I don't know, it's not not a feel good show. Um we are going to do an episode today about something that I've been sort of obsessed with for a while and it fits into so many trends, which you know is our favorite thing. We're going to connect some dots today. Ooh. Um it fits into conversations about wealth and inequality and how capitalism works and does not work. Uh mm -hmm. and also a little bit of a pulling back of the curtain on mm -hmm. a force behind American capitalism that I think people aren't that aware of. It's called money, people. Money is that force. <laughs> In the form of um, a thing called private equity. And, and what we're going to talk about uh, with our very special guest today uh, is private equity in the retail space. Uh, and here's why, just as a case in point. A couple of years ago, you might remember, Toys R Us went bankrupt, right? 30,000 people lost their jobs, stores were closed, Jeffrey the Giraffe, the whole deal, right? It was terrible. Um, mm -hmm. Before they went under, though, they had been bought out by a couple of private equity firms, KKR and Bain Capital, who stepped in to, in theory, revamp that company, right, in the way that only private capital can, um, but they couldn't. And, mm -hmm. and what happened was that Toys R Us, under the burden of this private equity ownership, and I use that phrase uh, advisedly, burden, um, they went under. We reported on it on Marketplace when it happened, and now, uh, ever increasingly since then, um, similar stories are cropping up. Uh, a lot of companies who are supposed to be being rescued by private equity and, and that kind of capital are not, and, and that's what mm -hmm. we're going to talk about. And of course, it's much bigger than Toys R Us, and it's much bigger than retail. We are going to focus on that today because I think you've seen so many big name brands go bankrupt after being bought out, brought, bought out by private equity, like Payless, The Limited, Gymboree, Sports Authority. Um, but it, it really is private equity, I think, the man behind the curtain of a lot of the American economy right now. You may have seen recently that Taylor Swift was in a big, huge fight with mm, that's a, a good private one, yeah. equity company that owned the rights to her, a lot of her music catalog and were the American Music Awards even going to happen and that kind of thing. Apparently, it's uh, quite a scandal because it's increasingly involved in English Premier League. Like you're seeing private equity companies take big ownership stakes in Manchester United. And anyway, um, according to a study published in July, private equity is directly responsible for more than half a million jobs lost in the last decade alone, indirectly responsible for up to 1.3 million jobs lost overall. And so as a result, and I think because of these high profile bankruptcies, it's starting to get some backlash among progressive politicians becoming exhibit A for the case, one of the cases that it's time to rein in Wall Street. Today it's about Wall Street, in particular private equity. Anyone remember Shopco? You know why Shopco's closed? Private equity. Toys R Us, 30,000 jobs wiped out. Shopco, 14,000 jobs. Brookstone, David's Bridal, Payless. Private equity is behind 597,000 lost jobs. We are making Wall Street nervous. <laughs> That's good. I identified like five of those voices. I was pretty, I was pretty happy. I think myself. I did too. The only one I don't know is the first one. It, you, I will yeah. say we do have a yeah. recognizable... Uh, political yes. class. Yes. Yep. Um, Personalities. So, to, to the aforementioned uh, very special guest, Marketplace reporter Mariel Segarra has been covering retail for us and uh, Toys R Us stories specifically for a couple of years, um, working on a special series about how we shop. Um, and we're going we're gonna to have a, a good conversation with her. Mariel, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. All right. Welcome so, back. Yes. I feel like the Toys R Us, I really do think the Toys R Us thing I mean, I could just say from personal experience, for me, that was a big wake up call. Like I thought, wait a second, Toys R Us hadn't necessarily not been making money. It just had a huge debt burden because of this buyout. Like, how does this all work and leave a company in some cases in worse uh, standing than when it started? 
Yeah, private equity, it can be a bit confusing for people because it can actually mean a lot of things. In this case, we're talking about something called a leveraged buyout. Um, but private equity firms are just investment firms, right? They they bundle together money from different kinds of investors, some wealthy individuals, uh, also pension funds and endowments and foundations. They take that money and they make investments that in many cases uh, yield higher returns than the stock market. Um and one of those kinds of investments is when they buy a company and try to flip it. And that's called a leveraged buyout. Um, and that's what we're talking about here in all of these cases. You know, all the bankruptcies, Claire's, David's Bridal, Payless, Jimbery, Toys R Us, like all leveraged buyouts. Um, and I can just sort of explain what that is. Yeah, uh, let's, because the, yeah. it's the yeah. leverage part the leverage that's the key part. thing, right? Yep. It's the debt yep. that right. gets piled on that these companies can't pay. And I think, I think we ought to unpack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when they buy these companies, their plan is to flip them within a few years. Um, they want to buy at a low price and sell at a higher price. They often do that by coming in and cutting costs, laying people off, cutting their benefits, cutting hours. That's something that gets a lot of attention. But also, yeah, the way that they do this, the leverage part of it, uh, I'll use Toys R Us as an example. Mm -hmm. They were bought for, I believe it was $6.6 .6 billion dollars. Um, by Bain and KKR, they didn't put that money up in cash. They put up, it was about 20% of it, and then they borrowed the rest. So they borrowed $5 billion, and then immediately after buying Toys R Us, they put that debt on Toys R Us's books. And that's how a leveraged buyout works. You take out money to buy a company, and then once you have the company, you make the company pay that money back. Um, and so these companies are just drowning in debt. And it can actually, these things can be successful. They have been successful and, you know, ended up in, in very high returns for investors and not ended up in bankruptcy. But if something happens in an industry, if an asteroid hits, in this case, the asteroid was Amazon, mm. it makes it very difficult for the company that has $5 billion of debt on its books and, and payments to make every month. It makes it very difficult for them to spend any other money to compete or, you know, improve their online operations. And the same thing happens in media, too, right? Because you get news, you have newspaper companies being bought up by private equity, and then this asteroid called the Internet and online advertising comes and, right? Right. Yeah, same idea. Um, and, and private equity can work particularly well in growing industries. It's worked well in healthcare. It's even worked well in, um, with a couple of retailers that were bought around the same time as all these other ones. So, like, Michaels and Dollar General are two examples of leveraged buyouts that actually hmm. went the way they were supposed to. Um, and both of those companies were taken public and the private equity companies, uh, private equity firms cashed out. But um, for the most part, though, yes, this has this has failed in yeah. retail. And it's and it's you see the same things happening in media. Hmm. Is are there any rules? I mean, are there any <laughs> rules that say, I know, Sorry. I feel like I'm always the one asking that. I'm such a <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't there be like a rule that says that maybe that is too much debt or there should be some kind of a calculation that you do that says this yeah. company could definitely, I mean, I guess what I wonder is as an investment class, how risky is private equity? And is it kind of like you get what you well, it, is it sort of like it's a risky class and everybody knows that? Or are there any rules in place that say this should should work most of the time? I think both of those things are true. Yeah. So the, on the rules, there are rules that private equity firms have to follow, but they're not regulated in the same way that banks are or that public companies are. Under uh, Dodd-Frank, they introduced some new regulations for private equity firms. Now, if they're above a certain size, they have to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, and they have to report certain information about their employees, about conflicts of interest, about uh, the size of their companies. But it's very limited. And a lot of the things that we've been talking about, you know, when, when a private equity, when a leveraged buyout ends up in a bankruptcy, often it's the workers who lose. They they lose out on on severance that they were supposed to get. Um, they lose their jobs. Their jobs just disappear. Uh, executives end up still getting paid huge bonuses, even through the bankruptcy process. 
And so there was a bill introduced this summer by Democrats that would address some of those things that would attempt to put regulation around that. It does not have a chance in a Republican controlled Senate. But that shows you how how limited the rules are. Yeah. Hmm. Let me put on my private equity guy hat here for a second and and offer this thought. All we're doing is aiding in the flow of capital through this economy. And if these industries into which we have pumped this money can't keep up, that's on them, man. It's not on us. Yeah, I think that there is there's an argument to be made um, that private equity firms, they they target companies that were already struggling in some sense, that they think that they could make more profitable. Companies that they say might have eventually filed for bankruptcy anyway. And so when these things are successful, they say that they saved a company. Right. Um, right. And that they're actually adding value to the economy. Uh, they also say that they point out that their returns are often higher than that of the stock market. And so for regular people who have pension plans that want to invest in private equity funds, um, that that can also add value to the Mm -hmm. economy. So and and yeah, I mean, I don't think that any private equity firms want to see their investments fail. They didn't want to see bankruptcy isn't the the option that they wanted. But I think it's true that when they do fail, the people who lose out the most are not right. the private equity right. firms. Right. They're the workers. Yeah. Right. Is also, though, I mean, I wonder, is this like so many things an issue of scale? Is there more private equity money now? You know, is this hmm. sort of a spreading? Because it does feel like as you as you look around and you look at just this list of names that we've talked about just in retail, it seems like private equities tentacles are everywhere and i wonder That's how true. much that has mm-hmm. increased in the last you know decade or so cuz it just feels like there's a ton of money around i know that it has increased um and and also private equity is in a lot of industries and services that you wouldn't even imagine um so one thing private equity firms do after the financial crisis they bought up a ton of homes in foreclosure and now they're renting them out um yep. And so you have a private equity landlord. Um, They also have gotten into municipal services. So cities that are having trouble running their sewer systems or water systems or even emergency services like 911 have gone to private equity and and partnered with them, if you want to call it that. Hmm. Um, And so now what you might get is improved. You might get new pipes, you know, in your water system. Um, and it might be more reliable, but also your rates go up exorbitantly. And maybe you have to move. Or maybe, you know, there was reporting in the New York Times on this about 911 now being run by private equity firms in different towns and the response times not being fast enough or firefighters mm-hmm. being provided by private equity firms. Right. Yeah. So, so just back to Molly's regulatory question here, right? Because uh, obviously uh, uh, unrestrained capitalism, which this is a, a pretty good example of, can lead to not great results for a lot of people. Having some passing familiarity with Congress of the United States, uh, what are the odds that any of this gets regulated for reals, you know, like substantively? Yeah, right now I think the odds are very low with the with the makeup of the House and the Senate that that we have right now. Um, when you look at the bill that came out this summer, it was sponsored solely by Democrats in the House and mm-hmm. Senate. So there's, there's uh, as on many issues, there's <laughs> wide disagreement here about whether private equity is a, a good thing or a bad thing for the economy. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think, yeah, unless, unless the makeup of the House and the Senate changes, I don't see anything passing on this. Well, that seems like yeah. a sort of typically <laughs> bummer place to leave it. <laughs> I, I should, Sorry. I Mariel question, man. <laughs> Sorry. Mariel yeah. Segura, thank you so much Thanks, for Mariel. coming on Make Me Smart. You can find Mariel's uh, reporting on the Toys R Us story and all things retail yeah. at marketplace.org. Because she's great. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <sighs> well, there we go. I, I did not mean to end it on a downer. I'm just saying. No, I don't think you did. Right. I mean, I you know, I, I, well, and I so, think as with so many things, we want to talk about it being good or bad. And the right. question is, like, can it be good with limits? Right. 
or bad without them. Bad without them. And, and, and look, just to, to complete the circle here of where we started up at the top with all that vox from mm-hmm. the politicians, if you've got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren advocating for something that value neutral here, that polarizes the discussion. That's just the way yeah. it is, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that has to be taken into consideration when you think about regulations, which is exactly what Mariel did. Anyway. Well, and I you think go. you, yeah. I mean, I look, I think the reason to have this conversation is because this it has been such an invisible force for so long. And we are starting to now see, you know, we talked about that study in July about how many jobs have been lost. Mm-hmm. That's data that I think people aren't aware of that that publicly, you know, private equity owned companies are twice as likely to go bankrupt as publicly owned companies that almost six million Americans work for companies owned by private equity, even if they don't know it. Right. Well, that it's, it's in schools and, yeah. and football clubs. And, you know, so I think the question of the politics becomes ultimately a question of constituents. Like if people start to become aware and go, oh, yeah, this is not. Yeah. I thought I was working for a company that was just trying to sort of like be sustainable as opposed to get kick-ass returns. Oops, sorry. Well, well mm-hmm. I think you could say that. Uh, but but also, the it's, e. it, it's the, you got to see, it's the <laughs> epitome of the fallacy of shareholder value. Because right. you're creating value, it in this really case, is. for an extremely concentrated set of shareholders at large cost to uh, others in that chain. And that's the way Yeah, the incentives, yeah. as always. Yep. Or what do the yep. thing? Um, all right, 2019 is winding down. That means it is going to be time for our year end predictions. <laughs> In the next few weeks, you're going to hear from Kai and me about what we think is going to happen next year. But we also want to th- to hear from you, and of course, we want to hear your thoughts on this episode and all the other ones that came before it. But what do you think is going to happen in 2020? Send your prediction, ideally as a voice memo, please. Make yes. me smart at marketplace.org. And we have a little guide up on our website, makemesmart.org, on how to do that. (laughs) Make a voice memo. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. And uh, once again, one of us is ready for this conversation, and the other one uh, Mm -hmm. is not. Yeah. I guess you're just going to win. Oh, no, this time I'm calling in skunk. (laughs) All right, well, now we need to tell people what's going on. I do not have a news fix. Yeah, we do. (laughs) This is why. <laughs> no shame in my game. I don't know what's happening in the news, and I don't really care because two dogs who live in my house got skunked two nights ago at 1030 at night. And all I have done since then is try to de-stinkify so what, myself and every piece of fabric and animal. So what? I mean, I, mean, I could tell you what, some things that work and don't work. If you if that would be well, helpful maybe news fix, put, maybe we could put that online, and you know that'll be the web digital bonus for the episode today. We but should. what happened? We I mean, were you, were, you, were you sitting there with a glass of wine and and reading a book uh, contentedly, and the dog came in smelling like skunk? Is that what happened? I mean, basically, no. I, so it was bedtime, and I let them out into the backyard for their bedtime pee. Yep. And they just went shooting out into the yard, and, they, and wow. I saw it. I saw that little wow. monster. And I immediately ran out behind them shouting like, no, no. And then I like one of them had gotten skunked and the other one was still chasing the skunk. And so while I went to the uh, one who was chasing the skunk thinking, oh, he's going to get sprayed. The one who had gotten sprayed unbeknownst to me ran into the house and rubbed his little spray body all over every couch and bed that he could find. Oh, the entire house. You didn't close the door. Oh, man. Oh, no, because I was in a panic. I was like, get away from the thing. Yeah, "Yeah, no, I mean, I, I failed in so many ways. And then. Well, no, look, the not. whole house smells like gasoline and onions. So maybe things are happening. Yeah, thank you. Well played. Oh, my goodness. Well played, producers. So oh it's possible that things are happening in the world, but I don't really know what they are. And I can tell you Nothing. that that's kind of peaceful. Nothing's happening. Um, but as an update, I have now watched three episodes of The Mandalorian. Oh. I'm back. Right. I'm back. I All thought right. I was out, All right. but I was encouraged to continue. I, I think we should just leave it there. And that is my antidote I, I, to these troubled times. I, I don't think we need any more uh, on a news fix uh, uh, segment <laughs> than just that. So let's let's move right along, shall we? Okay. Seriously, let's. <laughs> I think that sounds great. Yeah. It's nice not to know. Yeah. It's nice. You should there try we go. it. Let's all not, live in not the way I tried it. No. Skunkless. All right. We, uh, we're going to hear from you guys in a minute. Uh, but before we do, today is Giving Tuesday. I'm taking the ASPCA off of my list just for today. <laughs> No, no, no critters. <laughs> anyway, after all the shopping and the sales, Giving Tuesday is a, t- a day to think about the causes and the organizations that matter most to you to do those end of year donations. Make sure you're maximizing your tax deductions. And we hope that that list includes news you trust. Like? 
us. Uh, yes. Look, so, so here's the deal, and all y'all know this, but we kind of have to say it anyway. Nonprofit public service journalism is what we do. Uh, you need it, we need it, the country needs it, um, but we have to have support from all y'all uh, to keep it going. Uh, so we, we do ask, we beseech you uh, to include us in your year-end giving plans, if you would. Marketplace.org slash donate is where you can do that. Yep, and since it is the donation time of the year, we have we have a deal. Of course we got we a deal going this week only, just like, you know, all the cybers. Uh, for this week only, our friends at the Candida Fund, who, near as I can tell, literally just exist to match donations, which is kind of awesome. Uh, they are matching their donations, though, for this week only, two for one. I've actually never heard of this. This is very exciting. Yeah. I'm somewhat new still to public media, and this is a big <laughs> deal. Uh, I'm like staring you, at the when, rundown when, when, in delight right now. You'll see it on the video. Uh, your donation has three times the impact. This is the first time that we have ever done this, and it's only happening for a few more days. So give now. Marketplace.org slash donate. Please. <laughs> I'm really, keep Molly I am like happy. really keep pretty Molly excited about that. Keep us all Two employed. How about that? How about that? That's a better one, right? Keep Molly happy and keep the rest of us employed. How about that? Two it's to one true. matching from the It turns fund. out Market- I need a large white <laughs> vinegar budget that I yes, didn't expect. That's right. Marketplace.org slash donate. <laughs> um, please. We need your help. Thanks. All right. And now it is your turn. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Brent in Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. God, GDPR seems like so very long ago. It really does. Uh, we may have to update our state. I know, right? Sp- speaking of what I love, can we keep that last guy? Yeah, I mean, okay, that guy, right, he's, okay. ne- he's never going. Uh, I'm speak- with you. Speaking of long ago, uh, we did our Explain-a-thon last week. Uh, one of the questions we took was about whether rural America might get left behind as electric vehicle infrastructure, which is to say charging stations and stuff like that, expands on the coasts, but maybe not so much in the middle of the country. Got a couple of comments on that. Here's one from Fez Imam, who says, eh, maybe we're looking at it the wrong way. I think the fallacy we're making is we're thinking of EVs like gas-powered cars when we should be thinking of EVs like cell phones. We can charge our cell phones very quickly if we want, but there's nothing stopping us from charging them slowly anywhere, anytime. Similarly, uh, I've seen a number of EV enthusiasts who live in rural areas and are able to charge their EVs in the middle of nowhere, perhaps more slowly than with dedicated infrastructure, but very capably. And this has allowed them to, in fact, be more self-sufficient because they're totally disconnected from the oil and gas infrastructure. And so um, I think if we flip the way we think about charging from a centralized location we have to go to, to something that's available to us in a 110 to 240 volt socket everywhere, it can change the way we use vehicles. Thanks. Love the show. Uh, so I think that's totally right. I, I do think that mm-hmm. the caveat there is time, right? I mean, if I need to go pick up the kids up from school and they're 30 miles away, I'm making these numbers up, and I've got 22 miles left on the range of my EV and school gets out at yeah. 310, you know, what speed is the train moving in the opposite direction at, right? You know what I mean? And, and having <laughs> yep. to do that math is a little hard. <laughs> but, but look, he's, he's, he's totally right. Provided we have the time to charge slowly, I think that probably works. I think there's never been a better kibosh on electric car purchasing, though, than the idea that you're going to have to do like a complicated verbal yeah, yeah. equation to figure out how you're. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I I can tell you that I'm fascinated with this idea of decentralization as a, an antidote and a, a an adaptation technique. But I do think, you know, you still do fundamentally have this question of like, how far can you go right. and can you charge at that place? to get back home yep and that's the big i mean you know it's i grew up in a state where we considered a five and a half hour road trip to be not very far like practically a day trip exactly but you need charging all along all along uh speaking of which by the way needing charging we occasionally need to charge need charging on on the explainathons because we don't know everything although well i certainly think i do but i won't smooth Um, one of the questions we took a pass on, uh, in fact, only one of the questions, because we only passed on one, was how should our economic indicators change to reflect a service-based economy rather than a manufacturing one? Tony Wagner, to whom we passed, uh, did not let us down. He got Marketplace reporter Mitchell Hartman to answer that one for us in a blog post, and you can find it at makemesmart.org. Click on the episode page for the Explainathon. And that's what I like to call the double delegation. I know, right? Yep. <laughs> that's exactly We right. delegate Tony to Tony. Like, yeah, Tony delegates to Mitchell. To Mitchell. 
That is an That's efficient right. process right, right there. The week before the Explainathon, we talked with economist Esther Duflo about her Nobel right. Award winning work, alleviating poverty using randomized controlled trials. Here is a comment from a listener named Mayu about RCTs in social science. Hey, Kai and Molly. This is Mayu in Pennsylvania. I listened to your interview with Esther Duflo, and I want to suggest another possible reason why randomized controlled trials aren't used more often in economic research. So one of the frustrating things about social science research in general is that a lot of the questions really don't lend themselves to randomized controlled trials because they would be impossible or unethical or impractical to perform. Like if I want to study the effect of childhood trauma on addiction later in life, I can't just randomly choose 100 children and traumatize them and then see what happens. And I think this is a particularly common problem in economics, and I wonder if maybe as a result, a lot of economists don't even think about randomized controlled trials when they think about the techniques they have at their disposal. So kudos to Dr. Duflo and her colleagues for taking a broad view and recognizing the usefulness of these methods in their work. Love the show. Thanks for doing what you do. That's a good point. It is a good point, but aren't the kids already traumatized by the poverty, right? We're not, we're not taking them from comfortable living and saying, all right, $2 a day, go. And you're six oh, years no, old. Oh, no, yeah. I th right? Absolutely. Okay. I think he's just saying that's because I was like, isn't this how science is supposed to work? Yeah, yeah. And, so, and yeah. she was saying not in the social sciences. And he right. makes a good point right. about why yeah. it hasn't necessarily been. Yeah. <laughs> why you can't always create a problem just to test. Right. If it already exists, then absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. So also in that interview, we talked about classroom size. Uh, and I said uh, that class size does not always make as big of an impact as people think it does. Also, one of the findings that Duflo came across in her studies uh, in India. And here is uh, Dee Burley chiming in on that point. Hi, Kai and Molly. I enjoy listening to your podcast, but I was a little concerned the other week when I heard from you that class sizes do not improve educational outcomes. My understanding was, first, that the research that was being done was in developing countries, where there may be a lot of other more important factors. But second, the research that I've done as a teacher and as a person with an education master's indicated that while class sizes are not the only thing, having a class size that's huge certainly doesn't help. I would love to see some clarification on this issue, especially as everyone already seems to know what they think needs to happen in America's classrooms. So, uh, I, I have a very good friend uh, who is uh, deeply experienced in education policy uh, and has occupied senior government positions uh, and also in the private sector at a very senior level, who shared that mm -hmm. with me over a number of beers uh, one night uh, a number of years ago. Um, so I will double check and I will get some sourcing from him <laughs> and, and we will we will figure that out. I, I would say though, that, that about about class size working, you mean? Yeah, because uh, we had mm -hmm. we have thrilling discussions at my house. Um, um, but I guess, I guess, I think we're saying the same thing, right? That, that yeah. my point was class size is not dispositive. Her point is that class size, huge classes don't necessarily help. And I think that's, that's sure. sort of similar things anyway. Definitely. And right. then yes, when it comes to Esther Duflo's research, yeah. it was done yeah. in developing countries where yeah. that, there may be significant differences. Um, but yeah, uh, believe me. For uh, if only to avoid further voicemails, I in no way <laughs> intend to prescribe what I think should happen in America's yeah, oh yeah, classrooms. For sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to suffer yep. through yep. America's classrooms for a few more years. Just Last but more. not least, here is our make me smart question and answer to the question, in fact, which is, of course, what is something you thought you knew and you later found out you were wrong about? Uh, this answer comes from listener Linda Lynch. Hi, Molly and Kai. This is Linda from El Segundo, California. The Make Me Smart question, what is something you thought you knew but later found out you were wrong about? My husband and I have always prided ourselves on being as efficient as possible in our work and personal lives. You could say we are a bit obsessed with efficiency. I thought that striving for efficiency made us better. However, as I've gotten older and wiser, I've learned that we have been wrong. In so many parts of life, efficiency isn't the best option. Children don't learn best by learning efficiently. They learn by circuitous exploration and wasted time. Most important relationships don't develop efficiently. They unfold in myriad ways. The economy is not based on efficiency. In fact, I would argue that our economy is based on lots of wasted time. Think countless hours paid to employees on unused projects. Think coffee breaks at Starbucks. And look at tech. While Google has certainly made our search for information much more efficient, Facebook and Instagram rely on lots of wasted time, the black hole of social media. So while my husband and I will continue to strive for efficiency, we've learned to scale back our obsession a notch. 
What we have thought of as wasted time may just be the good stuff that propels our economy, inspires new innovations, and makes our lives fuller. And thanks, Molly and Kai. Make Me Smart certainly makes efficient use of my travel time. I'm not going to argue Aww. with anything right there. That's that's. I know. Cool. I love that. That's funny, actually, because while I was in the midst of the skunk disaster, uh, a friend called and basically was like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to pass on a saying that I have heard many times that I think applies in this moment, which is <laughs> don't just do something. Sit there. Sit there. Right. Yep. It was like, just yep. sit down, breathe. Yeah. Like, it's going to be fine. Don't sure. feel like you have to, you know, solve this whole problem. Which, of course, caused me to be like, the fee if I don't do it, it'll last yeah. for months. Yeah. Anyway, eventually I did sit down and it was really good well, advice. Yeah. But I understand also being slightly panicked at that smell in your house and having to do something. So, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But what a good saying. Yes. Don't just do something. Sit, sit there. there. Love it. You guys are You guys are always so smart. <laughs> All right, that is it for the podcast. Uh, but you can always find more of us, more of Kai and me. We are everywhere in the form oh of your smart listening device. Every day, actually, we bring you a one minute explainer on your Amazon Echo device. Just tell the Amazon lady, you know, to make me smart. <laughs> and you'll get these little tidbits that make you smart. You will love it. There, there we go. The music's yeah. saving us from ourselves. Just vamping. Just Once vamping. Again. Make Me Smart is produced and directed by Sam Anderson. Our digital producer is Tony Wagner. Our senior producer is Jody Becker. Thanks to our video producers, Ben Hethcote and Cynthia Betabiza. Also fun to say, in New York. And to Erica Phillips, who writes our newsletter and our Alexa skill. This week's pod was engineered by Ben Tolliday. Our theme music was composed by Ben Tolliday and Daniel Ramirez, the executive director of On Demand. It's Tarnieves, the senior vice president and general manager. He's never All right. See you later, everybody. Bye.